Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tosh Berman. This is Tosh Talks. And today I want to talk about Jean-Luc Godard, the great, the iconic French filmmaker. And I have known Godard, not personally, but I have known his work, or even more important, his presence, ever since I was a child. Uh, I think due to my parents um, who went to see his films, especially, especially Breathless, uh, which was his first feature-length film, which of course I think most of you have seen already, or you will see it, or you will come across it, or the image of it. And the beauty of Godard's work is multifaceted. Um, he's an artist, a film artist, who never really looks back ironically, considering that he's totally obsessed with film history and film theory and film, film and filmmakers of the past, yet his own work comments on the past that it's always done in the sense of him being in the present and someone who looks ahead. He looks in the past, is for inspiration perhaps, or for knowledge, but he takes that knowledge and he presents it in a fashion that is very startling, very creative, and very brilliant, and uh, often controversial, just due to his nature, his characters, I think is controversial. He sort of has this sort of uh, take all or take nothing attitude, or he questions everything. And um, Godard is very much of an artist that you participate in. It's not uh, end of the story. As you know, Godard said he always, or some interviewer asked him, um, don't you believe in the narrative, you know, the, like the beginning, the middle, and the end? And uh, Godard answered to that question, yeah, he said, yes, I do believe that. But not necessarily in that order. I mean, it could be middle, end, and beginning. Why not? And uh, Godard questions the narrative of a story, the narrative of a way it's present it, and also the difference between real life and the film world and film history compared to real history, though film history is very much a real history of sorts. So Godard is basically always questioning the process, the artistry, and everything to him I feel is not a closed case, though he has made very strong arguments for perhaps a certain filmmaker or even his politics. But I think that changes over the years. And, uh, but he still argues for it at the time. So Godard is very much of a verb, not a noun to me. He's a man, an artist who keeps on going, who keeps on changing, and who keeps on exploring. In a way, he sort of reminds me of like a David Bowie or like early, not early, but like the Beatles in existence who always consistently not only change their music, but they're also questioning things and accepting everything and then digesting it and then bringing it out in, as their artwork. And Godard very much does that. He's so much different from like his contemporaries like uh, Truffaut um, and the other French New Wave directors, even like Bresson. Well, Bresson's not really French New Wave, but um, uh, Godard of that whole sort of French cinema group of the late 50s and the 60s is not only the most radical in my opinion, but also the one who's also the most qu questions everything on a regular basis. He never settles for a simple answer. Each answer brings up more questions. And that's sort of the beauty of Godard's work. And um, one of the things I love about Godard is his sense of graphic. I mean, we all love, I'm sure you as well, love the Jean Luc Godard movie poster. So many of them, right? All around the world, and each one is designed beautifully. There's something. Godard is blessed with either being, either being surrounded by great graphic artists, or graphic artists are attached to his visual sense and his image. And uh, over the years, I have collected many books on Godard. I have at least, oh God, I don't know how many books I have on Jean Luc Godard. I've been buying books as a teenager, and most of those books came from the 1960s and the 70s. 
uh, all film theory books, books by him, books about him, books regarding him, books about this, books about that. Jean-Luc Godard is just an iconic presence in our culture, at least in the Western sense of culture. And um, one of the things besides collecting books and you know, DVDs and whatever, or VHS tapes of Godard's work, I also collect his soundtrack work. And his music is very, very, very interesting to me. Um, Well, for one thing, the early Godard works, soundtrack works, are very conventional music sometimes. But it's interesting when you hear it on the soundtrack where you see the Godard image and then when you play it at home on your turntable or your CD player or your whatever means of way, ways you listen to music, it conveys something different. Um, Sometimes when you hear music, soundtrack music, it brings you to the, to the scene, right? Like if you saw the movie, you hear the music later, you immediately think of that movie scene or that moment in that film. But for the Godard soundtrack, I don't get that. I get something totally different. It's almost like a separate message or, or a different aspect of, of, the, uh, of the relationship. <clears throat> in a way, it's sort of like you know a couple and they're having an argument. And there's like his version of the st argument of the story, and then there's her version of the story or argument, or two people, two guys, two girls arguing. There's like two sides of the story, you know, the flip of the coin, all that cliche, blah, 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 blah. And I think Godard, the way he uses the early soundtrack is that way. I'm not sure what the process is, but like, um, well, some of the composers he worked with it was, uh, I, mean, I don't, for somebody who's totally obsessed with French culture, I can't speak French. I'll explain that later in the future, future talk shows. But uh, the composers who work with um, Godard or done soundtrack work are people like Martel Salal, who did Breathless. He was a great, is a great, is he still alive? I'm not really sure, but he's a, a great jazz pianist and a jazz composer. Michelle Legrand, if anybody who knows me knows I'm a huge Legrand film for many re reasons. Uh, Georges Dulaire, Dulaire, D E L E R U E, who did uh, the soundtrack to Contempt, but probably one of the most haunted pieces of melody ever. And, uh, and uh, Martin Scorsese used that same soundtrack for his film Casino in a very good way. Uh, Paul Mizraki, who did Affleville, great film, of course. And for Pierre Le Fou, was Antoine Dumal. And then, um, and then uh, Anton Dumas also did uh, Weekend, Godard's Weekend. And anyway, so for the years, I have bought various compilations of Godard's work, either like a French New Wave collection of different composers working not only Godard, but on Truffaut films and Melville films and, you know, Alan Rene films. There have been various compilations, especially in the CD world, uh, many, many, many. All of them coming from, apparently, from either France, logically, of course, from France, but also from Japan. Um, if you go to Japan, you can find these Japanese-only French New Ways compilations or compilations of, of a particular fil film track, songwriter, e pretty easily. Um, it's harder to find these works on vinyl. Um, because usually there's only maybe like 10 or 15 minutes of original music, not enough really for a 12-inch release. So the French released soundtrack uh, music a lot on like a 7-inch EP, like during the 50s and 60s. So um, as the formats change, it's, it gets harder and harder to release this. Like, you know, you can't really get, you can get a contempt 12-inch record, which I do have one, but again, it's just really one side of a record, or it's a 45 RPM 12-inch. Um, but nevertheless, um, really, very recently, I found a, um, an album on vinyl, and I'm going to show it to you right now. This is the front side. As you notice, has no wording, no titles, no nothing. Just a picture of Anna Karina, Godard's 
wife and main actress during the 60s. Here's the back cover. Now, I want you to notice that this cover and the back cover, the image is pasted on board, on the record sleeve board, which means, not always the case, but this is very much, this album is very much like an art project. It's actually a limited edition work of 500 copies, each one numbered. This comes with it, this little piece of paper, which credits what's inside the record. And I am number 491 out of 500. Um, this is a great compilation of Godard's music. One, because it is a bootleg, obviously. And because uh, I don't think any record label could release entirely the whole Godard soundtrack recordings from 59 to, what is it, the years or 50? Um, from 59 to 1980 because it goes for different record labels, different artists. It's very complicated and very expensive, I think, for a record label to put this together. But if you're some, you know, going under the bridge, under the water type of personality, and you have a love for something, you do it. And this bootleg of Godard soundtrack is obviously a work of love, and not actually to make money, as far as I'm concerned, or what I know, may or may not know. Nonetheless, why is this compilation the best of all, even better than the CD compilations or stuff from the past? And there's certain songs here that are not on any compilation. Though you can find it on possibly another CD and stuff, but it's just difficult to find. This is all great because it's all in one package. Uh, the rarities are the six songs by uh, Chantel Goya who was a yay yay singer from the 60s, who eventually became a huge um, uh, pop singer for children's songs. She may even did a children TV in France, made during the 70s. But in the 60s and as a teenager, she starred in Masculine and Feminine, a Godard film, as well as singing six of the pop songs, which is a, uh, a film about, well, not about, but it, the, the, the background of that film deals with a French yay yay singer, and she does all her six songs which are on this compilation. The other one is uh, from the movie The Chinese, uh, Godard's uh, hardcore malice, uh, far left film that he made, has a pop song, a yay yay French pop song called Mao Mao. And Mao Mao is done by Claude Cannes, 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 C-H-A-N-N-E-S for those who speak French can pronounce it better. But that is an incredible song. Mao Mao is fantastic and very hard to find. You can find it on YouTube and stuff like that, but <clears throat> to get it on vinyl, impossible. And believe me, I looked for a long time. And now that I say this, I'm sure there's probably 20 of you out there if I have a copy, but this is a great album. So you're getting the soundtrack to Breathless, you're getting the soundtrack to um, uh, female, female, you're getting, uh, uh, you're getting a soundtrack to uh, uh, Contempt and Weekend and Alphaville and other films, the earlier films of Godard. It's a double album. And each label is giving you a close look of sorts, not that great, but you get an idea. Each label has a picture, a scene from a Godard film. Well, except for this one, there's a beautiful shot of Jean-Luc Godard with Bridget Bardot shooting Contempt. And here's this. Anyway, just to give you an idea of what that is. So you get this, you get that for the whole package. Now the thing about Godard, I want to say about this soundtrack album, and what was so moving listening to it completely, is the separation of the image and the sound. Um, this seems to be not an issue of sorts, but it is a difference. And, uh, you know, when you see a Godard film, it's often very funny, very biting, sometimes sad. It is sad in parts. Always questioning, as, we, as I mentioned. But listening to the soundtrack, especially the orchestrated soundtrack of uh, Le Grand or uh, Domile or, um, or, or Georges Lear, overwhelming sense of sadness. It's a really, really sad listening experience, just because the melodies are very um, 
haunting, bittersweet, a sense of lost. And uh, films like Contempt, you know, just on top of my mind, is a film about lost and regret and uh, a great deal of sadness. And music exactly conveys that feeling. But when you listen to it on a vi piece of vinyl or on, or, in this, or, or on a stereo system, the music lives on its own. It's not, it doesn't, it's not tied to, it doesn't have to be tied to the, uh, the images on the screen. It, these are really powerful works. And I suspect that Godard commissioned or his producers commissioned these composers to do their music. And I think Godard just took it and he edited it to that music. I don't think he instructed the composers what to do. I think he allowed the composers to do what they want, he'll do what he wants. I can be wrong about this, but this is my gut feeling when I look at a work of Godard or I listen to the soundtrack. Now these early films are different from his later works that he did like in the 80s and 90s and to this day. Uh, Godard himself becomes, in my opinion, and I think most people agree would, would agree with this, he himself becomes a soundtrack maker. He becomes a composer of sounds. He doesn't write melodies, he doesn't get behind the piano, but he, as a collagist, makes sounds using other people's music, uh, uh, sampling this, sampling a little bit of uh, orchestrations, sampling a little bit of uh, classical music, and he mixes it with some like Leonard Cohen song or a Bob Dylan song. or uh, uh, My memory, I, I come up with Leonard Cohen. I think he plays Leonard Cohen music snippets a lot in his uh, music, in the, especially the films he made in the 90s. So Godard is, when you go see a Godard movie of the 80s and the 90s, it's a little bit off subject of the early stuff, so forgive me. But when you see Godard films of the 80s and the 90s and so forth, the music soundtrack is just equally as important as what the visuals are. And it's another like layer of Godard's work where he's, um, he's conveying not what's happening on the screen sometimes, but this sort of like, a after, not an afterthought, but almost like a subconscious thing that's working there. And it's really unique. I can't think of another filmmaker who does that, except, except David Lynch, who uses soundtrack music in a similar way, I feel. Like, it's not just melodies, but he, he has all these sound effects, right? Especially like when things, the screen goes dark and the character goes into a dark room. You hear the sort of subliminal noise or humming and stuff. And, which is very David Lynchian. But I think Godard in his own fashion, not exactly the same thing, and he was first Godard, uh, uses the same techniques or the same type of philosophy behind it. And so therefore, for Lynch, of course, you have to really listen to I think if you're a big Lynch fan, you have to get the soundtrack records, because that is part of the bigger picture of the, of the, of the Lynch film experience. It's not only going to a theater and listening to, uh, or seeing the work and seeing the narrative, but also I think you have to go home and listen to the soundtrack of it, or the music. And Jean-Luc Godard is the same way. The early work, uh, you need to focus this on the music because you're getting a lot of information there. You're getting something else. You're getting an emotional thing. And it's the, it's the, it's the flippancy of Godard, that sort of punk rock of Godard, where he could say something on the screen, yet the music says something else. It's like a dialogue between the two. And when you listen to the soundtrack, you realize there is a dialogue taking place, or an argument of sorts. And it's a, just a very dynamic, dynamic relationship. It's in, an incredible experience. So getting this is very hard. As I mentioned, there's only um, 500 copies made, and never again will be made again, um, unless somebody else will take up on the project. Each one is individually, each cover is individually glued onto the, in, on the cardboard 500 times. So this is not a factory thing. This is actually a handmade thing. The sound quality is great. Um, I'm not sure how, where the, uh, uh, the bootlegger got the sound quality from, or where he got this the source from, made from CDs. I don't know. Master tapes, I don't know. But it sounds great. And again, the way the, uh, this record label put together, which are called Wildcat Strike Disc from Paris, probably from Burbank, but who knows, um, is it's this really essential compilation of Godard's work. And if you're a Godard fan at all, you should get it. If you love soundtrack music, it's a must. 
And again, you get the French yay yay stuff, but you get this beautiful orchestration, and it's a great balance here. And this is Tosh Berman, and this is Tosh Talk. Thank you.